time right oh it's past time this is a picture i gave you i want to give you because you know we're talking about jesus walking on water so i told you you know i got that great paper on study and what it means and you see it's really fun because in history you know we like well i don't know we like to think that everything is known that's known but everything that is known is not known and before as i've talked before you know the and i i didn't re review this but you know time is something that you have to figure out the ancient egyptians i think it was around a thousand bc uh discovered or, or divided up the the time and likewise people have to determine you know the measure and one of the most obvious measures is the foot because you know you food foot the stride or the foot, a stride is a yard. Did you know that? A uh, basic stride is yard. A foot is a foot, but whose foot? You know, <laughs> choose. Okay. So you're going a lot further. Tammy says, you know, she does twice the steps I do on her step meter. It's like, you know, I'm just walking it. She's just walking. But, you know, it's whose foot and whose stride. Okay. Right? We'll take LeBron James' foot or something, and it's probably twice the size. Well, 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 I think leg leg comes in there. <laughs> and leg leg, right? Well, yeah. and then, then you have, uh, you know, do you want someone with really short arms measuring your yards of cloth? <laughs> Just saying, you know. No, you, you want Paul to do it. Bro, he's got those long arms, or maybe maybe LeBron James. Don't they have like six feet arms or something like that? Yeah, I got double the the yards. Anyway, I think it's it's really interesting. But then if we give ourselves us a uh, what do you call it a a fixed reference, the fixed reference is that this sea is six miles across. Now, to what Anne was talking about which is very interesting as we get to the, uh, as we move into this, we're going to see something really interesting that, of course, you know, the, uh, I guess the professors and professorettes would use in a negative fashion because it's, it's very interesting what happens in the account. But we'll see what that really means within the context of history because that's the point, right? What do the people think? It, it, or what did the people perceive this is, as? It doesn't really matter what we think. Um, you know, like I said, I'll say it over and over again, right? So we make a fire. In the ancient world, you could get croaked for making a fire because making a fire, you, you know, that's what you get. That's what the people did in all the Grecian lands. Remember, since uh, Alexander, the Macedonian Empire, basically the, the Greek empires, the three of them, so Egypt, and the Seleucid Empire and the Macedonian Empire, three of the Alexandrian empires that broke apart into their empires because of his generals. Basically, in the Hellenized world, you lit your hearth fire once a year from the temple fire, from the, the, from the temple fire that was done originally at Olympus. And that's how we get the Olympian flame. The Olympian flame is not to light for the athletic events. It is to light your hearth fires. And that's what they did is they went all through the Egyptian or all through the lands of the Greeks to do that. And how much you want to bet the Romans did something similar? They did. The Romans did something similar because they like to copy what the Greeks did anyway. Um, but they, it, it is 
What did the Hebrews do? We don't know what the Hebrews did. It's not written in the Mishnahs. It's not written in the Thomistic documents. We have no idea how they did it. But what do you think? You know, they kept the temple fire burning on menorah, right? So what do you think happened at, well, Hanukkah may point to that, right? At Hanukkah, the, they kept the menorah lit. Did they light the hearth fires from menorah? We don't know. That's an interesting question. Because fire was always considered sacred in the ancient world. So what does that got? We've got, we have situations, like I said, what do the people perceive it as? To them, fire is a spirit, not a natural event, not a natural thing. To us, all these things are natural, from turning on light bulbs to, you know, to driving your car. These are all natural things that are within the confines of the world. To them, they're supernatural, every one of them. So we get to this point, and this is a, a very interesting statement. So Jesus has come across the water. I think I left 19 up for you. Accordingly, then, uh, they were having pushed or rode a score 25 or a decade of 30 stadia. And were look, having looked closely at Jesus treading all around on the sea and near to the sailor coming, and they were frightened. And now Jesus speaks to them. So obviously close enough. He wasn't obviously not, he's not ways away. They recognize who he is. They can see who he is, even though it's night and it's dark and it's stormy. And then he makes this statement. He said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Now this should, you should guess from this already where we are. But he said unto them, it is I, be not afraid. Even the King James has the same statement. The but legea, he makes and the logical argument, atwas to them, ego imi, ego imi, I am. Not you be a frightened, don't be frightened. But the he, I should take that up, but the he, that's, it's still in there, the he makes a logical <laughs> argument to them. I am, don't be frightened. Now, I had missed this before. This, you remember, I am, the ego emi statements almost always precede the signs that he does. So this is an indicator of a supernatural ceremonial sign, obviously supernatural sign, because he's walking on the water. So in this, you know, <laughs> a trigger indicator I put that there, I thought it was funny. If you're a James, if you're a Brown guy, this is a trigger indicator because Jesus himself He's making this statement that we saw rarely, rarely used. We see it um, a couple of times in Mark, very seldom in Matthew, but very used much more often in John, as well as the is form, the identity form of John. So he, the I am to a Hebrew person, that's Yahweh. That's making a direct statement that I am, basically I am God which is very interesting in the context. But he's also telling them, okay, so remember it said the, the gods of the wind, the gods of the water had weight, the spirits of the water, which is means gods. The gods have awoken. The gods are inflamed and on fire. They're trying to do what? Beat down Jesus. And Jesus is walking on the water. Not just walking, sauntering on the water. Harry Pato. And that and if you notice, he's talking to them. So that noise, right? The noise okay. You hear it, right? You're asleep in Kansas is always when you're asleep. For some reason it happened during daylight. But you're you're laying in your bed and you hear and the winds and the rain dashing on everything. So obviously, what happened when Jesus spoke? I mean, you've got to have a really loud voice to get over this. I mean, we missed this part because, um, all right, thank God we're not living on a homeless street or someplace out in the wilderness, but guess who does, right? These people are used to, um, anybody ever been to a log cabin? Lots of holes in a log cabin, right? Now, I've got books that tell you how to, how to make them better, 
<laughs> but if you've ever been to a log cabin or some of the houses that, you know, and yes, in the Middle Eastern houses, now they use concrete bricks, you know, and they put masonry over them. That's pretty good. What do you think they used back in the good old days, right? You know, what do you think they were living in? So, you know, we talk about being close to nature. I don't want to be that close to nature, but people who are living in nature, right? And we're talking about fishermen. Um, well, you know, that's almost as bad as a farmer. In a farming community, you know, okay, nowadays you can get in your cab, right, and turn on your GPS and start up your tractor. You can do your work. <laughs> turn back, with your satellite, with your satellite radio. Yes. Right, and you can, you can also listen to XM radio while your satellite's going because you got to have it, right? It's a requirement. Anyway, but what did they do back in the good old days? Right? In these days, if you're a farmer and it starts to rain, what do you think? Oh, you can't go out to the fields today because it's wet? No, you're out there. You're out there chopping in the dirt, right? And if you're a, if you're a fisherman, you can't tell your wife, oh, honey, it's rainy today. I'm sorry, you're going to starve, right? No, you go out and you get some fish. That's what you did. Um, today, I mean, there are people that no kidding have to work out in the weather, close to nature, but the rest of us don't want to get that close to nature because nature is kind of painful and dangerous in some cases. But here we have Jesus, right? So can you hear him? I mean, remember the statements they make? Oh, yeah, Jesus was sitting on a sandbar or he's on the coast. He's a ways away. We know that it's stormy. It's, it's dark. It's night. How'd they see him? He was close. How'd they hear him? It doesn't need to tell us. It's, this is an unstated tell us. It doesn't need to tell you that you know those winds that were waking are quiet enough or Jesus' voice is loud enough that it overcomes it. And he makes a statement. I am. He's telling you that he has not just the power over God's, He's making a claim that he is Yahweh. There's a flat-out claim that he is Yahweh. We saw it in Matthew Mark. The point of this event is to show the power of God, of Jesus, over the Greek gods. In the, in the case of Matthew Mark, it was more specific. It was, in this case, it's more general. Because it was very specific in Matthew and Mark. In this, it's more of a generalized statement. And also, in Matthew Mark, did Jesus say, I am? Remember, I told you, I think that this is more written to the Greeks and the Latin. However, we get these uh, Hebraic points out, right? We know that uh, Matthew was a good Hebrew. Well, all those guys were good Hebrew boys. But think about the statements, why they might not make a statement like that, right? Mark used it as the climax, right? In Mark, they, Jesus, when they're coming to get Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane or, you know, for arresting him, and that is the point where he goes, I am. And they all fall down. An indicator, right? In Matthew, it's not used. So Matthew was probably, um, when you think about it, the more Hebraic, the more Judistic in, the, in their thinking they are, what do you think? Do you think they would use this term or not? Yeah. The more Hebrew, or the more Hebrew you are, the less inclined you are to use that statement because you're not supposed to say what? The name of God. And even the name of God in a foreign tongue, because I've told you, you know, the, the identity form is huge in Greek, you don't use it. When you see it in Greek, go ahead, read, look at all your Greek literature. If you see Ego Emi in almost any Greek literature, that is a rarity. We see it in the Gospels, and we see it in John over and over again. That statement from a Hebraic standpoint is claiming to be God. From a, he, from a standpoint of a, well, look at it within this context. What absolute identity is Jesus making? In this statement. Power of nature. Yeah, I think that's, well, his power over the gods, that's <laughs> nature to them, right? 
but also don't be frightened. And that's that is, you know, I put it. Notice the absolute identity. I am plus the classical angelic statement. <clears throat> this is what they, if if you ever meet an angel, the angel always says. Every angel says, "Do not be afraid," which means that angels look like something you should probably be afraid of, right? <laughs> You know, so whatever they are and whatever they look like, they're scary. They look scary to a human being. They're hagios, right, in the Greek. So when you see one, they tell you, it's okay. <clears throat> Do not be afraid. It's the first thing they said to Mary. It's the first thing the angels say. It's interesting that Jesus is not stating he's an angel, but that he says, Do not be afraid, which means what does he probably look like to them? He's glowing in the dark. He's glowing in the dark, yeah. The author, the writer doesn't tell us, doesn't need to tell us. He's not wasting space because he expects you to figure this out. Dark on the water, raging storm, raging wind, and then this guy's walking across the water. How do you see him in the dark? Right? It's not like... It's not like you're, you're, you're bailing out the ship, the sailor, and Jesus, like, comes right up to you, and he goes, hi, and you go, ah, right? It's like you see him. That's the point. I mean, is it, I guess it could be a great horror movie, right? It'd be really funny. Anyway, then they were, this is, inter, this is the interesting statement here that probably misleads but we need, you need to look at this when the, the context of the ancient world. Then they were willing to take him onto the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. Right? So that misleads a lot of these professors and professorettes that say, oh, look, you know, Jesus was on a sandbank, or Jesus was on the shore, right? He's on the shore. And the disciples never noticed that they were close. Well, let's see what it says in the Greek. The Greek is, is always the, the teller of the truth for us. It's always fun to see exactly what it's saying. Come on, go down. There we go. And then, they, then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land, whether they went. Uh, at the land, they willed or desired. This is an interesting statement. Anyway, we'll see it. According to their certainty, Levine to take hold of, take hold of him to or into the sailor. And Euthios directly, Igeneto was caused to be the sailor on or against of the gates, the soil, the land, to or into who, which, what, where they were led under. So, uh, anyway, accordingly, they desired to take hold of him into the sailor. And directly was caused to be the sailor against the soil into which they were led under. Um, okay, so we're presuming that people who were rowing, right? That, why are they rowing? Yeah, yeah the <laughs> sailor tells us. You can't put a sail up in the wind. Not that kind of wind. Not that kind of wind. Okay, that's how they move. Not, not when it's a storm. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you, you know, your masks don't break. The further we get detached from the age of sail, you know, every every kid in Britain, right, in the 1800s, what did they do? Whenever they got a chance, you know, the, the Britain's a coastal-ish country, so most of the kids live around the coast, and what, and even London, the Thames, you could bring big boats up to the up to the Thames. So in Colchester and all those places, what are the kids watching? The boats, the ships. They're beautiful ships. And the sailors, and most of them don't want to be sailors. Well, maybe some of them do. Anyway, uh, that's that's C.S. Uh, Forster and, and Hornblower, right? Everybody wants to be like Hornblower. Oh, that seems like a horrible life to live. But anyway, so they watch the boats. They know this because when the storm comes up, what do they do with the boats? They either move them out, and how they move them out, they row them. They pull these big boats because if you lift the sails when the wind's high, it could demast you. Well, it could it could flip you over, demast you. It could you know ruin your rigging. And uh, you know, I, I'm just starting the rigging on my model ship, 
and boy, rigging is just painful. They, they actually say in the plans, it really helps if you are a professional boat rigger. <laughs> like, well, thank you very much. No, that's really helpful. Yeah, the last guy who died was like 100 years ago that was a professional boat rigger for a, a sailing ship from the 1800s. Yeah, that's it. You're done. But anyway, um, so they're rowing this. That's why they're rowing it is because they can't put the sails up. And so they're rowing it, and yeah, they're, they're too stupid to know that they're coming up on the shore. Now. Maybe they can't see it because of the condition. Well, like I said, it says they rode halfway across. Yeah, we know from the previous text that they were half, they were in the middle. Yeah, they're near the middle of the thing, and then they see Jesus because this is not this is not an indicator of where they are. This is very important. This is an indicator of the power that God has. The power that God has. Okay, remember I told you. The Greek gods, there's only, there's only uh, basically three accounts of people that walked on water in history. A Buddhist monk guy, Orion, and there's another guy that, that Poseidon allowed to walk on water. I think it was the monster. It was a monster that was allowed to walk on water. It caused tor terrible, he's not remembered because he wasn't human. He's just a monster dude. Anyway, so you can put Orion in there. Anyway, gods did not need to walk on water. What did they do? They used... The air, the Aranos, they went through the Aranos because that was their sphere. So what is the author telling you? What? Well, I think this is an absolute historical account. So what is Jesus telling you about his ability and power? Miracle. Well, miracles. He of, dominates water and air. And he has bullets. power over the physical over the physical realm of the game, yeah. right? Yeah. Right? And you say, and we, we go, well, what? You know, if you have miraculous power, you have miraculous power. Okay. So how many um, miracle makers have you ever heard that you get in the jetliner and the next minute you're in London Heathrow? Right? Has that ever happened? <clears throat> That's a real miracle, right? Well, you pass through the... Uh... Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> yeah, right through the Bermuda Triangle, right? And hopefully not through TSA. But but you see what this is, right? This is Jesus basically overcoming not just the forces of the world, right? We would say natural forces, wind, whatever. He's overcoming the gods, but not only just overcoming the gods, it is showing that he has absolute power over the gay, the the entire physical world, which was that the time and space continuum. Yeah, yeah, you know, to us, yeah, the time and space. Of course, to them, they don't know what that is. The point is, you know, it does no one does that? I mean, if you showed them an airplane, they would immediately think, "What is it?" It's like Asimov says, right? The higher technology, it looks like the gods. It looks like a miracle. It looks like, and to them. This is not a scientific miracle. This is a this is an indicator where Jesus. Okay, look, you gotta live in the culture you're in, right? I don't care if you're God. I don't care if you're Jesus. I don't care if you're a time traveler. If you come back into it, if you're back in a time, what do you have to impress the people with? What they know. I mean, if you pull out your big lighter and go, you know, they might say that's a miracle. Right? But if, you know, and, and they would immediately think you have power over Zeus. And if you're really smart, you go, look, I have power over Zeus. <laughs> but, you know, I'm making my big lighter work. You know, I'm just saying that you work within the culture you have. And, you know, that's what Jesus is doing. Yes, sir. There was a guy at, in public affairs at Spirit Air Systems who had grown up in a, a native village in Nigeria. Uh -huh. And he came to go to college in the U.S. and stayed to work at Spirit. And he said that when they saw airplanes, they assumed that they were driving on glass islands. Oh, really? Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Never heard that before. The uh, the Pacific Islanders today, 
you know, they do the Christmas delivery thing. My son did that, you know, so they take C-130s and they deliver Christmas packages to them. And they've been doing that since World War II because it was building allies in, you know, against the Japanese. And so they, they've they come, I, I didn't say expect it, but, you know, we have been giving them gifts for a bazillion years and the U.S. military does it. They know, know all the sites and they deliver it. And, you know, at the beginning, they thought it was literally the gifts from the gods, right, that were showered on them with parachutes. So, yeah, you know, look at it. Take off our cultural blinders and see what the people think about it. Anyway, so now we're getting to some really interesting stuff because I think Ann said it before. You know, if you read further in the chapter, you know, remember, I always tell you, in John, John gives us a sign, and then what does he do? He gives us a dialogue that explains the sign. And so remember, you got to remember all the other stuff that we had before chapter 6, and now we're in chapter 6, and we've got him. What do he do? The 5,000? It's, it's Passover. The 5,000, he's walking on water. He makes them go to the shore, and then we get this day. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realized that only one boat had been there and that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples, but they had gone away alone. So let's see King James and then the Greek. It's a long statement in Greek. The day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there, say that one with or two his disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Um, this is going to go into an un, uh, a unstated telos. To the occurring or succeeding day, the oculos, the throng, the it standing ran through pests of the glass of the sea. They were stared at, that would be caused the small sailor, Allo, other or um, or another, no or not, he was in that place, not at least one, and hold you that because no or not, this is an interesting new word, sinistelen, he entered in company with, he did not enter in company with the learners, Messiahs, of him, the Jesus, into the plan of the sailor. Um, other things, contrarywise, remaining by self, the learners of him, they came or went off. Um, okay, okay. Now, this, it, it, I think the English is a little confusing. The Greek is a little better. The occurring on the succeeding day, the throng standing across the sea, they having stared at because no other small sailor. Okay, they're not talking about the sailor that the disciples were on. They saw the disciples get on that sailor on that boat the, it's a pretty big boat right and leave and they knew that jesus had not left with them so in other words it's saying there was no other boat and why does it say small sailor play on why does it say a little one something that could be handled by one person yeah exactly the sailor guys right you sailor guys because you know you, that big sailor it, one person can't sail it but a small boat a swift class right i think a swift class is small enough for maybe a sprite class whatever that little boat is right you, one person can handle that but no such boat was there so this isn't this isn't talking about the other boats and saying there was no other boat there wasn't a small boat that jesus could take that was a place if not one and because jesus had not entered in company with his disciples into the sailor trying to terrorize and remaining by himself his disciples went off. In other words, they're looking for who? For whom, I should say? Jesus. Jesus. And they know that Jesus didn't leave. So where's Jesus? This Okay, so like, where's, uh, what's his name? Waldo. Waldo. Where's Waldo? Waldo? Where is Jesus? Yes, sir. You know, just to be a little contrary here, how would the people on the other side know that Jesus didn't get into the ship if they were on the other side? Because how would they have gotten over there to know that? No, these are the guys that he fed. These are the guys, okay, when it, when it says on the same day of the throng, standing across the sea, they, that means that the throng 
that, okay, here, Jesus fed them. We don't know exactly where that was. We tried to pinpoint a location. You know, the, the biblical scholars aren't even sure. But we know it's across the sea from Tiberias because it said they headed toward Tiberias, right? So we know this is the guys that he fed. It's the same group. Same group, yeah. And they are across from Tiberius, not across from where he's been. Right, and they don't know where Jesus is. They have no idea where where the disciples go. I don't know. On where did Jesus go? I don't, yeah, they went on the boat. They're out fishing. They're out. They're out. They're not there. Bass fishing, right? They're not there. They're out partying. No, they're, they're making their time, but they're looking for him. So that's the point. And they didn't see the point of this in the Greek is. There was no other small boat, so where did Jesus go? Now, there's 5,000 of them, right, plus women and children. So what do they tell the kids? Hey, go find Jesus, <laughs> right? And so the kids are scouring the land, you know, and the wives are, like, cooking. Now they don't eat food. They're starving. What are they looking for? They want food. Jesus to give them more food. They want more food. Yeah, and we're going to see that. At this point, the proof text, people know that Jesus didn't leave on a boat, and yet it was... With the disciples, you know, he was with the disciples on the other side of the sea. They don't know that. They don't know that at this point. You know, one thing I think we're glossing over is that Jesus taught uh, the throng, which was, as we know, was more than 5,000. It, it was somewhere over 10,000 people. And if you look at a crowd of 10,000 people, how do you teach them without a public address system? Well, that's why, that's why. He had them lay back in some in a symposium, right? Yeah. And it says in Matthew and Mark, I didn't bring up those texts, but it mentions that he divided them into groups, I think of 50 or 100, right? Yeah. So he's spreading the message, and then we get the feedback. I, I wish I could remember all those uh, those terms that we use in, you know, the, the way bingo, the, the business bingo terms we use all the time, right? So Jesus sent the disciples out to collect the extra food. It wasn't to collect the extra food. He was sending them out to re, re-give the message, to, to make sure they got the bottom line. You know, like on the bottom of all your PowerPoint slides, you know, bottom line, it's like you have to tell me, the unstated tell us or the stated tell us again, right? Yeah, to make sure that people don't miss it in this era, like you're cracking me up, you know. Uh, anyway. So that's the reason Jesus, you know, Jesus taught them. How did he do it? I don't know. You know, it may have been he taught them because as he gave out the food, right, maybe he was able to speak to everyone or to groups or whatever he did. We don't know. I mean, this is one of those things that if you were, if you were there and you're writing it, in the second mission, that's the whole point of the second mission, they send a person that's full of, you know, chips and the ability to listen and record a whole year of Socrates' life. Apparently, in the second mission, that's the point. It's the second mission because they did that before for Jesus and listened to Jesus' words, and it changed their whole society in the book because they had heard Jesus and recorded everything he said. That's what we want to know, right? Yeah. How do he do it? Now, there's the other point. It could have been that he used a miracle to speak. I think it would have told us that. But there was this huge miracle of making the food. That's what the people were most interested in. That's what the author is most interested in. Yes, sir. Well, they said that he spoke over the storm and the disciples heard him. Mm -hmm. And they didn't state that either. So the fact that he spoke to 5,000 and they heard him could have that was what I was getting at. Well. Yeah. Yeah. See, I'll go for that because I see Greek is like that. Greek, Greek expects you to figure out the details because if, if you've read the, what the Wine Dark Sea or uh, what's her name, Ham, Edith Hamilton's writings about Greek, they will tell you Greek is the most unadorned language in the world. It, you know, they will tell you the boat was there. That's it. It wasn't a beautiful boat on the edge of the shore with the seabirds a-singing. No, the boat was there. That's Greek. That's a Greek iambic pentameter almost, right? So Greek is unadorned. And so they expect you, you know, if I say the boat was there, you expect it to be in a, 
in a harbor or in the middle of the sea or, you know, in a, in a desert? No, no, you expect to be in a harbor, right? And if I said the boat was tied to a dock or I, if I said the boat was at a dock, you would expect it to be tied to the dock in a harbor, right? They're, the Greeks do just don't need to tell you. I don't need to waste time telling you, you know, about all the details because you, you're supposed to know this stuff. That's Greek thinking. Anyway, I, I think it's really funny. So what you say is correct. Could have been like the Monty Python, though. What did he say? Well, blessed are the cheesemakers. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> you know, they actually, the Archbishop of Canterbury outlawed the life of Brian. Uh, that was, you know, one of the things. And John Cleese and the, the Monty Python guy said, Dude, you don't get it. This probably points more to Christ than anything because it's an irony. You know, it's, it's like a Greek irony. So if you think uh, of the life of Brian, you're like, well, yeah. You know, it, it's presuming that Christ really existed, right? Which we know he did, see? Because otherwise there'd be no Brian to mess it up. <laughs> they really weren't making fun of Christ. I mean, they were making fun of some of the believers and some of the the ways that the church, the yeah. rules and stuff that they put in place. Well, not so much the church as those who misunderstood, misunderstood. right? I, yeah, I, I, I think it's really funny because many times, well, we become too uh, Englishized, right? Englishized. Uh, we, we're, we expect intro body conclusion. Where's irony? Where's satire? As a matter of fact, I don't know if they even teach people to write irony or satire anymore. You know, I, I don't, and matter of fact, if you were, uh, what's his name, um, the guy who wrote uh, Lilliput uh, and uh, the Irish Solution, uh, Swift. Swift, yeah, if you're if you writing like Jonathan Swift today, you'd probably get cut off of Facebook because they'd say, wait, you're, you're, you're proposing to kill all the Irish so that you can feed them, right? <laughs> you know, I'm like, okay, the Irish Solution, he wrote an irony where he, you know, they were having a famine. And he wrote a, a sar, uh, sarcastic piece recommending that you just, you know, well, I guess you abort them. Oh. It's close to what we do today. Anyway, um, <laughs> to save them. You kill them to save them. <coughs> anyway, um, then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Okay. Do you see this? This is... This is a beautiful, what do you call it, uh, you know, solution answer to the thing. Howbeit, there came other boats from Tiberias nigh to the place where they did eat bread. After that, the Lord had given thanks. Okay, you see what happened? The, they went to Tiberias. Nobody knew where they went. Jesus ends up with them in Tiberias. And then boats come from Tiberias to that place. Now, I don't know why they're going to that place. Um, maybe they heard that these people need transport. Maybe they said, you know, figured, oh, we can, you know, somehow make a deal here. I don't know. But there were boats that came from Tiberias. And here it is, the thing. Uh, other thing, contrary wise, it came and went. The sailors from out from among Tiberias uh, near of uh, the spot that they ate the Arton, the loaves. The bread, um, he of, and this is great, Eucharistantos, Eucharistantos, that's, that's a, um, that's a gerund turned, in, you know, a verb turned into a noun, of he having been grateful, good gratefulness of the curio, of the supreme in authority of Jesus, basically, of the Lord. Contrary-wise, sailors came from out of Tiberias near the spot where they ate the loaves of the supreme in authority, having been grateful, good gratefulness. And then here's a map of Tiberius. I already kind of showed you, you this. the disciples couldn't say, hey, there's a ton of people on the side of the, of the sea that you guys need to go get. I mean, could they have been the ones that mentioned uh, it? Someone may have said, there's hungry people, take bread from Tiberius and you can sell it to them at double the price. <laughs> right? I mean, look, look, this, this is the way markets work. What do you think? You know, I think it's really funny that they have, um, what do you call it, an, uh, anti, you know, if you have a, a, 
a problem, right? The government expects you to keep your prices the same as they are, even though it may cost you triple to, to get this stuff into your shop. I mean, you know, the point is in capitalism, you have it available. What, what's the problem? You know, it, it's called free society and free markets. Oh, until the government puts its controls on it and regulations on it and want to put you in jail for selling a product to somebody that they're willing to pay for the price? I don't know. Whatever. But yeah, these aren't dumb people. They're like, okay, they need bread. We got bread. We got boats. Let's go get them some bread or maybe, you know, some fish. I don't know. They're, they're, why they're there, I would guess because they're, they think there's some market, there's some way to make some money. And also, there's 5,000 people there, men and the women. Uh, this is not a small crowd. I'm, I'm almost surprised that this didn't get recounted in other non, you know, um, we're always looking for non what, what biblical accounts, right? Secular accounts. I don't think there's any difference. I mean, what difference is there between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and a secular account? So let's say you had Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Peter. Or, or not Peter. How about, how about uh, Nicodemus? Or how about Jake? Or Brian? <laughs> you know? It, so Brian wrote, wrote, you know, the accounts down, and they're the same accounts. Well, what's, what's secular? Why do you call one secular and one, you know, a, a Christian, right? Yes, sir, Jeff? Just a bit of a sidestep. It almost seems like there's an underlying plan involved here because the disciples collected all the leftovers. So these people are going to get hungry again sooner than later. And now we're sending people back. You know, it just seems kind of a, why not get, let the keep, people keep the leftovers and then they wouldn't be starving us. Well, maybe they did. Yeah. It doesn't tell them what they did with the leftovers, right? We just know that God collected. Well, right, we collected. We collected. We knew that. Wow. Well, leftovers is a sign of death. So. Well, in in leftovers, uh, you know, people would probably eat them for like a few days, but leftover bread, you, you know, and it probably wasn't super. I tell you this all the time, right? In Italy, in the southern in the southern part of Europe, your breakfast is the bread that was left over from dinner, from supper, right? So that's why it's, and that's why they like to make bread that is a little bit hard on the outside because it stays nice and soft on the inside, at least for a day. But after two or three days, your, your baguettes are not going to be very palatable. But if you're, but if you're hungry, you can eat them. Yeah, croutons, right? In a starvation culture, you'll eat it. Right, and, and I think about the uh, again. You know, we're detached. We're detached from the the things in the past. What did they eat on sailing ships? And every you know, everybody knew about it. Right in that era, remember what they ate? Hardtack, hardtack, hard 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 cider. Hard tack, cider. You know, in, in uh, Treasure Island, they carried a. a Thing of uh, apples, you know, a big barrel of apples in the, for the people to eat. But the big deal with the hardtack is I have read accounts that are first person accounts from that period, and guess what was in every one of those hardtacks? Bugs, Bugs weevils. Oh my god. Well, I, I think most of them did scrape the bugs off. It's like, you know, there's a little bit of flavor, you know? <laughs> Let me eat. And, and by the way, they did make them more palatable by, uh, and I was I, I was having, at dinner last night, I was talking about sea rats and K-rats and lerps and MREs. You know, back in my day, when we ate the military foods, we still had the leftovers from uh, Vietnam and World War II, I'm sure. And... You know, the things that tasted great in the field when you're starving to death, when you're working with the Army, you take them home and you feed them to your kids, and your kids go, ah, you know, because with a really good meal, you know, none of that tastes great because it's, it's you know, whatever. It's canned food. <laughs> but, you know, when you're, well, even kids like Chef Boyardee SpaghettiOs. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I loved that as a kid too. I'm, I'm spam, not sure spam, what's wrong. In the spam, you spam it a cat. Uh, anyway, so here's where we think they were feeding them, right? And here's Tiberius, and that's at six miles. And we don't know exactly where it is, but it was somewhere across the Sea of Galilee. So that's what I wanted you to note because they talk about they went to Tiberius and then they said boats from Tiberius. So again, we don't know exactly where it was. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum. Okay, okay. So now here's an unstated point. Remember, they went to Tiberias. Where did they end up? Well, they eventually ended up maybe in Capernaum. It doesn't tell us, but that Jesus by this time and the disciples had done what? gone someplace else, right? And if you think about it, um, well... So this isn't instantaneous. I think that's what I forget. It's like, this might have taken several days. It's hmm. not like five minutes. It's hmm. not... A probably sailing about six miles. You probably row one mile an hour, so maybe six hours to get across, you know. But you're loading 5,000 people. Or plus, or whatever. I don't know. Well, and did they walk around? Yeah, but you're right. You're absolutely yeah. right. It's not like taking your motorboat. Yes, sir. I was going to say that many people. You let them walk around. <laughs> Where are they going to get all those boats? <laughs> Maybe had some money yeah. or some way to trade, right? I don't know. Um, it, it doesn't tell. This is that thing. We want to know, right? All the details. And the if, if we were Greeks wearing our Pelopons, you know, and our Himans, uh, then we would know. But we're not, you know, and so which unfortunate. Or if we were Israelis or Jude uh, Jewish people living in the land here, we would immediately know the answer to every one of these questions. And even if we didn't, in this time, we would be able to ask people, right? You know, so there, there's 10,000 people. Remember I told you, we know the size of Jerusalem was about 20,000. 20,000 probably men, right? So more than that, women and children. But the population of Jerusalem in most big cities was 20,000. They couldn't support much bigger because if you got much bigger, the sickness, plague, you know, uh, just the logistics of feeding them was just too much. And it points, though, we know that Jerusalem had a million people in it because when the pilgrim festivals occurred, they get. So Jerusalem, by the way, obviously is a wealthy or a poor city. Very wealthy because every quarter, well, not quite, it, every three months or so, a million people come to the city. And during the other parts, they have tourists. There's a huge Jewish tourist trade going on. Because remember at um, the festival, remember Philip, right? Philip talked to the eunuch who was driving back home on his chariot. So obviously they have, and, and before that, let's see, on the, uh, at, at, uh, at uh, Glossolalia, at the um, Pentecost. Pentecost. Pentecost, remember Pentecost, which is, Pentecost is not a pilgrim festival. During Pentecost, if you, I don't believe, you remember, there were all the different groups from all around the world uh, that spoke different languages, right? So Jerusalem is a very wealthy city because of tourism and religious tourism, specifically for the temple, because of what's there. And, oh, 20,000 people and 10,000 of them are there around the Sea of Galilee. That's huge. As a matter of fact, that would probably overwhelm almost all those cities, even if, you know, in that area itself. So it kind of explains a little bit why the Romans somewhat left them alone. I mean, that's probably a big money tax. Oh, yeah. To give her to them as well. But Pilate, you know, Pilate... Um, In my book, Centurion, I try to show Pilate as not so much a bad, evil kind of guy as just a Roman. I mean, he's an engineer. He's a manager. It's like, what does he want to do? He wants to send back lots of tribute to the Senate because the more tribute you send, what do you get? Higher positions. It's better. You know, you became a legatus. You became, a, you know, you might even become a senator, right, which is the highest peak of their society. Other than the empire, uh, you know, he killed enough people and you'd be the emperor. But anyway, 
you know, that, you know, that's the Roman thinking. That's the way, Roman way, right? Uh, glory, doxia. That's, that's our whole thing in life. So, yeah, you know, the, the Romans weren't interested in subjugating the people for just subjugating them. What do they want? Yeah, they want tribute. They want money. And, and there's a, a, you know, even the legionnaires. You think the legionnaires, do you think the legionnaires really want to go out where the people could kill them, even if they are have, have overwhelming strength, right? Do you want to be constantly watching your back? No, you want to sit in your little legion holes, you know, your little, you know, your legion, you know, they made these little things. If you read Centurion, you'll see, you know, what they built. But your little place where you have all the comforts of life, they feed you two meals a day, uh, you know, gruel, but whatever. And, you know, many times you might go out on, on leave and go to an inn where you get some meat. I mean, that's happiness. But roaming around fighting people? I mean, why would you want to do that? You could get hurt. You could get cut. You could get killed. This is not a goodness. So I'm just saying, you know, we we think, we, we many times think in terms of black and white, and I think today the world is more black and white than the ancient world. You know, people are more interested. Look, what, just saying, you know, um, they do it in role-playing games. One of the biggest deals in the, the role-playing games for the uh, modern era role-playing what happens when you get shot? You roll a dice to see what your damage is. Yeah, but you might die. You know, if you're fighting with a sword, although swords, if you get cut pretty good, you're going to die. But in the ancient world, like simulations that people play, you know, it's not like you're being shot and have, you know, instant, you know, instant death and you die. That's the point, is that as games become more modern and you get blasters or whatever, there's more room for negotiation because you don't want to suddenly start a range war with people that could kill you like with a single shot. You're done, right? Because I don't care what kind of armor you have, a blaster against your body is not a good situation. You see what I'm saying? So in the ancient world where people knew, for example, a single gunshot, you know, I don't know, um, people watch that Yellowstone thing, that girl got gut shot, you're dead. You get, get an arrow or, or a wound inside of your body cavity, you're dead. Very few people ever survived that. And people knew that. I'm just saying the motivations in the ancient world are different than the motivations sometimes in our world. And, and it's funny how it doesn't get reflected in society. People seem to be more violent today with more dangerous weapons and it's as if they don't understand the danger. Because what happens? You go to the hospital, they patch you up, and many times you survive. That would never happen 100 years ago. You die. That's it. So anyway, I, I, I think it's very interesting. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his sons were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum. Why did they go to Capernaum? That's where Jesus and the disciples lived. Yeah. I think it's really funny. We, we, we think of Jesus. Uh, uh, the Son of Man has no place to lay, lay his head, right? But he did, at least at this time. Then the people therefore saw Jesus was not there, and neither his disciples. They also took shipping, <coughs> shipping. They came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. In the Greek it says that which two accordingly stared at the throng that are because Jesus nor not is there. Not, however, the Matthai of him. So Jesus and the disciples are not there. In the basin they walked on themselves to and into the Polaria, the sailors, and they came or went off to or into Capernaum. They were seeking to worship or to plot the Jesus. So accordingly, at which two the throng stared at that Jesus is not there, nor his disciples, they walked themselves onto the sailors, and they came to Capernaum. They were seeking to worship Jesus. Yeah. This is really interesting, right? So they have some means, <laughs> hopefully they didn't take them over, like pirate them. That, that could get you in real trouble with anybody. But, you know, they went, they shipped, the shipping, this is correct, shipping. So they got on the sailors and went to Capernaum. They were looking for Jesus still. Accordingly, let's see, they went to Capernaum, they were seeking to worship Jesus. And the important part is, you know, this word, um, Zetonis, Zonetis, this word Zetone, 
It means to worship or to plot. To worship or to plot. It's very interesting that the Greeks have a word that means to worship or to plot. Is that the way they viewed worship? Or is that just the word? And, it, and sometimes I leave it ambiguously or I leave it in that way because it's not certain what they mean. Like sometimes it says that the Sanhedrin or the Pharisees sought to worship or plot. So what do you think? They're probably seeking to plot against him, right? As opposed to worshiping him. In this case, I think it's really obvious they were seeking to worship Jesus. Now, they're also seeking to plot to do what? Stand him up as king. Yeah, make him the Basilius because he fed him. And that's where we get the confrontation. I think we're going to have to wait till next week. But let's see. Here we go. This, I leave in the NIV stuff, but we'll just leave this at this. They found him on the other side of the rabbi. They asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And that's the beginning of the next section where, as I told you, you get a sign. And then what do you get? You get an explanation. And the problem is that in our uh, way of thinking in English, we seem to forget, okay, we see this as not sign and explanation. We see it as, oh, there's a great sign. Jesus did something. And then, oh, then he talks. They talk to people, right? They're directly connected. That's completely connected. And that's the point. Thank you, Father, for this day. We pray you look after this as we can. And we pray.